In this all-new episode, Angola's Unit de Cavallo, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Unitel, shares her insights on a global career and leading through crisis. These are Unice's defining moments. Hi, Eunice, and welcome to Defining Moments Mama Talk Talk. I'm really happy to have you on. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's really nice to be here with you. Finally. <laughs> I know, absolutely. I'm so I'm so happy that you, you took you took the call and you're on the show. So before we get into the nitty-gritty, just want to give you a chance to introduce yourself to the audience. Um, sure. I'm Eunice de Carvalho. I'm uh, it's always interesting to sort of introduce myself, to sort of pick what is it about me that I want people to know. Um, I turned 50 this year. <laughs> so I'm a 50-year-old woman from Angola, uh, a friend of Obama's for more years than I can count now. It goes back to yeah. 2000, early 2000s. Yeah, seven, 2007, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm Angolan. I'm uh, uh, talking to you from, from Luanda. Um, I'm a mom of three uh, young people. One was 20, one is 17, one will be 15 next week. Um, and uh, I'm currently the deputy um, general manager for um, a telecom company, Angola's uh, largest telecom company. So, so thank you, Eunice. You know, you said 20 and I thought, Who's 20 years old? Like, my where daughter, did they Sienna. Oh. She's 20. She'll be 21 in September. Oh, my it's goodness. It's been that long. <laughs> yeah. How is that possible? So when we it were at the front be. together, you were pregnant. Was it, was, was it with your son? That, it, it, was either my, it was either Kiara, my second, or Luca, my third. Because Luca was, was born Luca. in 2005. It was Luca. Yeah. yeah. So it Luca. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, time flies. Look at your son; is already ten. I know. It's it's yeah. when I look at other people's kids, I'm like, time flies. In mine, it seems like time is just moving along. <laughs> no, it's moving along, and I think that they their own pace of learning and their life moves at such a faster speed that they just pull you along. It's yeah. very different from when we were at that age. Clearly, yeah, yeah. You yeah know, no, our kids I mean, have they, lived around really the world and uh, been they're you know international kids, uh, yes. so which is very different from how we grew up. So, but that's yeah. that's who I am. <laughs> awesome. So, Eunice, you know, we're talking about defining moments, and you have had what I think of as an incredible career. When I first met you, you were a partner at a law firm in the U.S., mm -hmm. and since then, you've lived in Brazil. You've lived in. Angola, where you are right now, you've yes. been in private practice as a lawyer, you've worked for corporations, you've been, you've been everywhere. And a lot of what you've done has also been in terms of women empowerment. So when I take a step back, I'm curious to know what has been for you the biggest accomplishment of your professional life, would you say? Um, it's sort of, sort of tough to, to sort of pick one in particular, one, one particular defining moment. I think it's a it's, um, compilation of various moments where I sort of felt that um, when I started out my career um, at, the, at the law firm where we eventually met, um, it was a fairly large law firm. I think Fabry at the time might have had 300 lawyers, something like yes. that. And yet um, we were two or three African-Americans in, uh, in that firm. And so um, making your way in an environment, you know, sort of any law firm is a tough environment, particularly as you are making up the ranks from associate to partner. It's just a journey that's difficult for, for anyone. But then to, to do it in a country that wasn't my own, um, in, in, in a culture very different and being a minority, um, not just a woman, but a black woman and a black African woman. Yes. Um, and to, <laughs> to have been able to do that uh, successfully, um, for me, that sort of taught me a lot about um, hard work. It taught me a lot about resilience and, and persistence and leadership. Um, one of the things, for example, that uh, uh, very quickly, um, I was called to do is at the time that the firm had this effort to increase increase the number of minority lawyers, and so I was named was um, named to be in a committee, a recruiting committee, diversity recruiting committee, 
but since there were very few of us diverse members, uh, very quickly you had a leadership role uh, within that and to, to go out and recruit people and to 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 convince the law firm at the the, the uh, management committee and the hiring committee that these people uh, deserve to be in the law firm just like i was uh, yeah. was was a big training ground it's a big training ground to, to to learn how to make those arguments and to be successful at it and that sort of carried with me throughout um and and it taught me also that your career path isn't necessarily linear Mm. And that there are many people that have an influence in, in where your career goes, regardless of how good you may be at what you do. And yeah. so to accept rejection <laughs> is something that I'm very proud of. I, I think I've learned that it's okay to be rejected, that I yeah. gather energy and force from that. And so um, many years later in my life, I was... Um, technically fired from a job, which had never happened to me. I had been um, named to be on the board of uh, Sonangol, which is Angola's uh, national oil company. And uh, it's a five-year mandate, but after a year and a half, pretty much, our whole board was dismissed, a new board came in. It was the first time in my whole life I'd been dismissed from a job, but I very mm. quickly sort of drew back in those days of being an associate, trying to make my way um, into partnership and where you would prepare uh, a brief that you really would work on, you know, as you know, through the early hours of the morning, etc. And then a partner would take a red pen because at the time we would actually print. This is how old I am. <laughs> I remember that. I saw associate days. Yeah. Cross it. <laughs> right. I, I don't think, I don't know. I don't, I'm guessing these days they don't really print the documents anymore. Yeah. Uh, we would print the document and then a partner would just go through it with a red pen to sort of like your best work, the best that you could get out of you. And, and some of them were quite aggressive and sort of this is worthless. And, you know, this, we cannot yeah. file I remember this. That. Uh, exactly. And you sort of walk back to your office, you know, trying not to cry. Um, and so that you don't take that personally. It, it wasn't about you as a person. It was about whether your perspective in that document was just different than the partners. It wouldn't mean that it was wrong. It was just different. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of that's how I've learned how to face challenges like that in my life is that when, when something I do, something I put out isn't accepted, to sort of not immediately internalize that as a failure on my part, but to try to understand why, why, why did that happen? You know, and there are times that, yeah, my product or my opinion just was wrong, you know, it happens. Yes. Uh, and then other times, no, is that somebody had a different perspective. Somebody was looking for a different approach. It wasn't personal to me. And that really comes from those early days. And, and it's something I say in this sort of continuum of things, the moments that I'm proud of is sort of how do you, not so manage, much manage the highs, because managing highs are, isn't so difficult. Everybody is around you, everybody's happy yeah. for you. But how yeah. do you manage the low points and how do you use that as sort of trampoline for whatever comes, whatever comes next? And those are sort of the, the things that I was sort of building on. And, and sort of the third in that is how do you not just grow yourself, but how do you bring other people along? You know, I, I sort of, 20 some odd years after entering the workplace, I do have to say that that's what brings me the most joy these days. Um, it, clearly any sort of my own personal accomplishments, you know, that's always good, but how do, how do I look back and, and, and proudly can say, you know, that person is now doing this amazing thing. And I had a little piece to do with that, whether it yeah. was because I was a mentor or because we worked together and I feel like in some way I influenced that person in a good way or a bad way, uh, but that I, I somehow helped somebody move along in their career. And, and I have the privilege now of being able to look back and, and be able to identify people that um, are doing well. And doing well doesn't necessarily mean that they are in some, um, you know, sort of top ranking position, but it's just they're doing well in whatever it is that they're doing. And that, yeah, um, I was able to, to, to help them in that in that journey. So that's why it's hard to sort of name one, one moment yeah yeah because it's just it's 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 many years so i'll come back to your day to your dynamic career in a second but i do want to say this on the last point you made about the impact of other people's careers in their lives you do that so well 
And as someone who has, who's been, who's benefited from that, I have to tell you that because I remember we had really kind of conversations right before I came to the firm, right during my summer associate um, days. And you were always telling me to think about what it is I wanted to do. Not mm-hmm. just then, but what was the longer term plan? And how will I set myself up for success in terms of the longer term plan, not just what was in front of me, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember when you left the firm, um, Renee and I were, oh, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're in tears because you know mentorship plays such an amazing role, especially when you're in the minority. Mentor people sure. who look like you, who think like you, play such a critical role in helping you build that confidence. Right when you have those days with the red pen on your, on your brain, <laughs> exactly. you go to a place where you feel, you feel heard and safe and understood to like have your word vomit, but I just wanted to let you know that, you know, you made that difference for me, which is why to this day, if I have some people that have to call you up and say, you know, Eunice, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, I, um, I was mindful when I came to Fagri, as I said, there was one African American partner, um, a woman, but she was in a Denver office <laughs> and um, Leslie, I think was her name. Yes, yes. And, um, and so in the office, I was the only black woman. And so Felicia Boyd, I don't know if you remember Felicia. Yes, um, yep. She was a partner in Bizlet and uh, in the IP practice. And she took me under her wing and she really made me feel welcome and challenged and showed me the ropes and we're friends to this day and someone that I admire and respect a lot. And I really modeled myself in many ways after her, but then other, other yeah. people in the law firm as well, including men who really took an interest in my career. And I sort of always believed in this whole paying back or paying forward uh, as you would yes. um, to help people out. And as you guys came in, um, I just felt, you know, sort of mother hen, let me help take care of them, like somebody had taken care of me. But I remember, uh, you, it's funny, when you mentioned my leaving the firm, I sort of went back in time, which, you know, it sort of just seemed like pure insanity when I think back on it now, because here I was, partner at a, a, a very good size um, law firm in the United States and doing really well. And at that time, I was taking over the portfolio for Target and Wells Fargo, and I had, you know, and had all this amazing work. And yeah, I think there were some people in the law firm that looked at me like I was insane. Like, you know, what do you mean you're going back to, to Africa? Um, yes. But it, it has to do with that thing that you said at the beginning, always having a, a lifetime plan, which will change over time, but mm-hmm. always thinking sort of beyond where you are right now. Um, because if nothing else, that gives you the energy every day and particularly through yeah. the, the difficult moments, because you, you know you're meant for something bigger and better. And you know, even when you sometimes can't define what that is. And for me, that that was uh, that's that's where I sort of started this this way of, of working, where I'm always chasing opportunities, I'm always chasing um, new challenges, and so I don't necessarily um, know in advance what they're going to be. Because I will tell you very frankly, my moving home was uh, the the only reason why I moved home. I had three very small children, mm-hmm. and I didn't have family around me to support me. And my parents were getting older and I just felt like I wanted to be near them and I wanted them to be in my kids' lives and frankly, I needed some support. And that's why I moved. So that's literally why I left the law firm where I was a partner. And, yeah. and they had all these um, growth opportunities um, still at Pavey, but I, I left because it made more sense. But my whole life, I've sort of just moved you know, when I went to Brazil, it was the same thing. It was, it was an opportunity that presented itself and, and I just jumped on it. And so I sort of what I tell people all the time is just be ready um, for the opportunities that come, um, develop your ability to sort of identify them and identify the people that can bring those opportunities to you and just jump on them. Don't be afraid. It's like, what is the worst thing that can happen? It, it, is that fearlessness that a lot of people find really magical, right? I, I get the question all the time. How did I move to South Africa with, with, with mm-hmm. a child by myself? How did I move from Singapore? And my answer is, I don't know. I just, I just said yes. Yes, so you, yeah, it just, yeah. It, but I mean, that, that's exactly when, when I reconnected with you and you were in, uh, in South Africa, it just felt very familiar. Sort of you yeah. picked up, you know, you had a good job where you were, you had this opportunity, you moved, you moved with a child. 
to a country that wasn't your own, but it was a good work opportunity. It was, I'm speaking for you now. It was a good work <laughs> opportunity. It was you a can. great opportunity for your child also to sort of see the world in a different way and to yeah. be in Africa and see Africa. And, yes. and sort of for that moment, it works. And then when they say, you know, go off to Asia, okay. <laughs> and yes. now, you know, different sector, why not? And I, I think that's always what I'm challenging people to, um, you know, everybody will make the choices that are best for them. But I always say, do not make choices out of fear. You know, if your choice is to stay in the same law firm, like we could have still been at Fagri till this day, that doesn't mean that's the wrong choice. But yeah. if we had chosen to stay there, it would have to be for the right reason. It couldn't be just because, well, I'm afraid to do anything else or yeah. I'm afraid of failing or I'm afraid of, you know, not being understood or whatever it might be. Um, but rather that I stayed there because that's really what I wanted. So this constant sort of questioning, am I doing what I want? Am I challenged? Uh, there's some other things I'd want to be doing. That's just constantly sort of playing in my mind. And I'm always challenging people that come to me um, for advice to really start from that, you know, sort of, what do you want to do? What, sort of, what do you want to yeah. be when you grow up? Is that, is you that, know, uh, and that is such a big question. You know, I think well, when we ask kids that question, I don't think we understand how big that question is. Because when you're a child, yeah. you can dream big and it's, it's wonderful. But recently I've been asking myself the same question, what do I want to be when I grow up? Because I think something happens to you in your 30s. I don't know if this was the same for you, where you suddenly realize you've gone through a lot of stuff. You've learned yeah. a few things. You made a few mistakes. You've had some successes. And now you realize, wait a minute, I'm almost at the midway point. What am I going to do with my time here? And sure. So and I think, I think it's yeah. a good analysis you made to when you're a kid. Because when you ask a little kid, like if you ask your son who's 10, he, one day he'd tell you he wants to be a pilot. And the same, you know, two minutes later, he'll tell you he wants to be a doctor and an astronaut mm -hmm. and a car racer and whatever. And we, particularly in our African cultures, but, but at least when I grew up, where you sort of were designated to three or four positions. You could be a doctor, an engineer, a teacher. A lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. A lawyer. <laughs> and even lawyer was already a little, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, so, and, bit, and would yeah. sort of quickly want to pe put people in boxes so that even when your kids tell you um, they want to be all these things, the instinct many times is to say, no, no, you have to choose. You can't be all of those things. You have to choose. But the reality is that when our children join the workplace, it will be more like when they were kids. They will do different things in the course of their life. Because yeah. I look at me, I look at you, we're already not the norm, right? We're already jumping. And, and there's positions and professions, I should say, today that will not exist in 15 years and 20 years. Yeah. Um, we look at the tech world, for example, with the, the digital transformation. There are literally children being born today. The jobs they will do don't exist yet or they're just being created. Yes. Right, now, right. And so this, uh, this idea that your, your career will, you know, you will join a law firm or go into work for a company um, and, and then 35 years later, you'll retire from that company having moved, uh, you know, maybe to some, some, some level of seniority. Um, that is not real or realistic for most people. Uh, or people who do it, I think, increasingly are filled with more um, dissatisfaction. So I think we're sort of coming full circle a little bit to when we were kids. Not necessarily that you'll be a rock star and an astronaut and a car yeah. racer, but, <laughs> that but that you will do different things in your life in different industries. Um, and that you will have multiple careers you know, over sort of your, your lifetime. I think is, is becoming more real. And that's where we find the challenges of something new and something different. And, and particularly to young people, I'm, you know, I, I, through work, I deal a lot with the sort of teenagers, sort of from that 15 to 18 mm -hmm. year olds who are sorting out what they want to do, particularly girls. I think yes. they, they feel even more challenged in that now because I'm, by me anyway, because I'm always pushing them to sort of break boundaries, great, um, uh, sort of stigmas that are sort of attached to women and, 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 and what they're supposed to, to do and, and what kind of careers they're supposed, supposed to have. And to just show them that, you know, the world is really big. Because imagine if really someone had told that girl from Angola and one from Cameroon that we'd be doing these things that we're doing now, we wouldn't have believed it. 
Yeah. You know, we thought yeah. just getting to Fagri was wow, right? Yes, and it was, but there's, there was still a world so much bigger than that. And exactly. I love that you say that because one of the things I always wondered about you is I used to, I would Google you from time to time when we lost touch over the years. But then um, when you were, I think you were general manager for was Chevron in, in Brazil. Um, and I thought, how, how do you transition from a lawyer into this role? So I want to ask you about that because you talked about just, you know, taking different opportunities and trying out different things. You know, so what, what, what would you say you drew from in terms of skill set, in terms of um, personality traits to make your transition from sure. being a lawyer into a general manager in a foreign country? Yeah. Sure. You know, I, uh, it really had to do with preparation. I was, when I joined Chevron um, here in Angola, back in 2006, I guess it was. Uh, shortly thereafter, we, we received a new managing director, Alan Clyer, and uh, who, who became a mentor to me. And he always used to use that quote, that there's no such thing as luck, it's the intersection of preparation and opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so he really focused on preparation and he, uh, I was in the law function and then I transitioned to, um, from the law function to um, the board of Chevron here in Angola, responsible for um, public affairs and you know, all the commu communication, government affairs, and the corporate responsibility. And he used to tell me that I needed to learn the business, that even to yes. advocate for the business with the government and with the press and, and, the, and the public, I really needed to understand the business. And so he would invite me to meetings that I didn't necessarily need to be at given my function, mm -hmm. but he wanted me mm -hmm. to learn more about it. He would, he actually went on and, and um, submitted my name as the representative of Chevron into the boards of a joint venture that Chevron had with other oil companies in Angola called Angola LNG, which is a gas, uh, a gas project. And in there, my presence was all about the business. It had nothing to do with corporate responsibility or, or any yeah. of that stuff. And so, um, he sort of forced me into the business. And um, as I was promoted in Chevron, also, as you go up different ranks, there's the company itself um, demands that you do training on capital stewardship and, and other business management type issues. And so he really pushed me through that so that I was prepared and the opportunity came because back in 2011, 2012, around the Macondo uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Around yes. that time, there was an oil spill in Brazil at one of our um, Chevron operations in Brazil. And um, because there was all that Macondo uh, issue in the air, um, uh, the Brazilian government fined Chevron and uh, actually filed um, a civil suit against Chevron and also criminal charges against some of the Chevron leadership that were in place at the time. And so um, at that moment, um, Chevron, the corporation, needed someone um, to go to Brazil who knew about legal issues, about media, about government relations, but knew something about the wow. business as well. And so all of that preparation that I was doing, I didn't know what for. <laughs> I had no plan for what I was going to do with that preparation, but um, it all came, you know, they needed someone my name was, uh, was, was on the list and I went. And, and sort of about my name being on the list, it's something that I always tell people again who come to me for advice is you need to understand how in your company, in your government office, in you know, whatever, wherever you're working, you yeah. need to understand how the system works. How do people get promoted? What do you have to do? What are the requirements to the position that you aspire to? Who are the decision makers um, you know, who will have input as to whether you get that position or not? How can you prepare yourself and be visible? How can you take on challenges that uh, demonstrate extra challenges if necessary that demonstrate to those people that you're ready for those positions? And so that's what I sort of did over time. And so that's how my name showed up on the list. I also spoke Portuguese. I also was from a country that culturally is um, fairly similar to Brazil. And so it was uh, like the perfect storm. Yeah, it was all preparation made the opportunity. <laughs> exactly. And, and I jumped on it because, I, and, and, it was, and it, was, it was an intimidating situation. I, you know, in the moment, I didn't really think about it. 
afterwards, uh, particularly after I'd been there, sort of reality sort of sunk in that I was moving to help take over a, um, at the time when I moved to Brazil, I was going as vice president of Chevron in Brazil. And then three months after I got there, the president, who was someone that I worked with here in Angola, um, Kelly Hartshorn, she um, was named um, general manager for all of Latin America. And so she moved on to Venezuela, where the headquarters was, and I took wow. over as president. And so I just realized, thinking at the time, I'm, I'm taking over as president in a country where the previous president was under criminal indictment because yep. of the spirit. Yeah. Right? And I'm leading a whole business unit where I have people, um, I had an incredible team in Brazil. Any success I had there, it's completely because of them. Um, these were people that had 15, 20, 30 years experience in their field of work. Um, I had supervision over people who were responsible for operations and drilling and finance and wow. HR and areas where I either had very little knowledge or had never worked with at all, except sort of peripherally. And, um, and so that was where I learned about trusting your team. So first, making sure you have the best possible team you can have. And so uh, generally everybody we found there was terrific. We, we brought in some additional people, but it was really a terrific team at, at all levels. You know, and at the time I was president, the vice president, um, Dave Minemeyer was, Dave at the time, I think if he didn't have 30 years experience, he pretty well was close to it. And he just knew everything about the oil business. And so the CEO took me out onto the balcony of this room where we were, and he said, just let Dave be Dave. You do your thing. You'll never be uh, able to out petroleum engineer Dave. So don't try. Trust him, create a relationship of trust with him where you both know what your mission is, is a joint mission. If you succeed, it'll be great for both of you. If you fail, both of you will fail. And so that advice really helped me a lot till this day um, to just let people do their job. Make sure you identify the right people, align vision with them, make clear what the expectations are, the results that you need and let them work, let them do their yeah. job. And so that's sort of my transition to the business. That's how it came about. And then the growth within the business was that. It was just learning every day and to sort of being humble enough to admit that I don't know, um, which, <laughs> For most of us human beings, it's a very difficult thing to do, especially when you're the president. I was going to uh, say, the higher up you go, the harder it is to say, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Exactly. Yeah, I don't have the answer. And so to say, no, tell me about it. And uh, hey, can you take a, a couple hours this afternoon and you know, come talk to me about exploration uh, and drilling wells and all these things? Not thinking that I was going to become an expert, not at all. But because I had to defend our business unit, our budget, our plans, I needed to, um, to be able to do a thorough job. And so I needed to understand things. And so that experience um, taught me also a lot of humility <laughs> in, the, in the doing of our work. Um, so that's, uh, that was my experience in Brazil. And then that was the transition. And then it was just sort of growing from there. Wow. Yeah. No, it, it makes a lot of sense. Because at the time, I was reading this stuff and I was like, is Yumi's crazy? What is she, what is she getting herself? To? <laughs> no, it was since it was, you know, now sometimes I feel like I, I should write a book about my time in Brazil because it was just insane. We, we, I remember we were, um, again, the mission getting there was we had to get our license to operate back and the license yeah. to, to drill uh, that we'd lost and fight off the lawsuits and everything. And I, I'll never forget it. One day I was... Um, uh, went shopping with the, with a couple of the kids. So we're at the shopping center. We just gotten there, and um, so I was with the, the oldest and the youngest, and the middle one was at a friend's house. And so I just got into the shopping center, and the, Dave, the vice president, called and said, "You you need to come to my house right now." And they said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "You have to come to my house." And I said, "Dave, I'm shopping right now." And I thought, "Well, okay." So I took the kids home, left them there. And went to his house and it turns out um, someone from uh, the FPSO, which is uh, the operating vessel that we had um, offshore uh, in Brazil, uh, someone had found what they thought to be a bomb. Oh, and, wow. and, and all of a sudden we had to sort of set up this command center at his house and work with the authorities to go out there. Is it a bomb? Wow. Is it not? To evacuate, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I, they didn't teach me this in law school. Yes. Uh, law school did not be paid for that. You know, sort of what do we do now? Um, but again, 
you have a team, you have a team, you have a security office, you have a logistics office, or you have, you know, people that know this. And so what is my role in this? Okay, what am I really good at? One, I develop my management skills around being the leader of that, that team, but also the government interface, right? And so it's just yeah. always finding your place, know what your strengths are, your weaknesses. Inflates your strengths, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so when we were able to go through it, but that's, when you get to leadership, and I'm sure you, this has happened to you, you sometimes go through situations that have nothing to do with what you studied, with what you trained, <laughs> what you thought that's about, what you planned really. for. <laughs> I feel like that's most of the time, right? What you learn in school is like this much. Rel- oh, this yeah. Much rel- uh, you know, I'm not this, you know, people need to go to school. But yeah, yeah. the real learning comes once you real- you join the workforce, you know, because yeah. that's where it's unpredictable. It's, you know, things come up all the time. And so your ability to just roll with the punches is something that you really need to refine because most of the time that's all really happens. It's just the yeah. best to calm and, uh, and roll with the punches. So you went from one really intense situation kind of into another, right? So when you left there, eventually you got to Sonango. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk a little bit about your time there because I, I just found it fascinating. First of all, being, I think it's the largest oil and gas company in Angola, is it? It's state-owned or at least it was It's then. state-owned. It's the Angolan National Oil Company. Yeah. And so at the time when you were appointed, um, Isabel dos Santos was appointed as well during mm-hmm. that time. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious because she's been in the news for the longest time as Africa's wealthiest woman and all of this. What was it like working with her and you know, working at a time when, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about, you know, a funds being mismanaged or has she, you know, been, is she corrupt and all of that? And you're somebody who had experience engaging with government. So in, in your position, how did you balance all these different components? Sure. Um, it, was, it was a very interesting time and a very um, uh, sort of a growth opportunity for me. Uh, because when I was, I was at Chevron, I had just come back from Brazil. I'd been at, uh, I came back from Brazil and went into Chevron again here in Angola for about six months. And then I was made this offer to go to Sonangol. And in my mind, it was never to go work for Isabel because Isabel doesn't own Sonangol. Sonangol is a national yeah. oil company. We were named or invited to the board by the president of the country. And so my focus was always on, you know, um, what, why, you know, sort of people have questioned me before, why did you leave um, Chevron and go to Sonangol? And, and for me, it was an opportunity for the first time, I was an opportunity to work for an Angolan company. Yes. Because <clears throat> although Chevron has been in Angola a very long time, it's an American company as, at its essence. Um, and while in working with Chevron, obviously, Angola benefited from Chevron's work here. Um, it wasn't a direct, I, I didn't have a direct impact, um, I would say. Yep. And so um, I felt at that time I had had all this experience, particularly after having coming back from leading the team in Brazil. There was experience that as an Angolan, I could put to use in San Angola. Coming from the perspective of uh, people around business, around ethics and compliance, and that we could, I could help bring that to San Angola. Because the idea at the time, and this is how it was presented to us, was to turn San Angola to something more similar to the international oil companies. And so for me, that yeah. was just a tremendous opportunity. It was sort of one of those, okay, the door opened again. I've learned all these things. I can put them to use and I can put them to use for, for, my, own, for my own country. And so when I went into Sonangol, amongst the various um, areas of responsibility that I was given, one of them was human resources and to be able to um, identify future leaders, identify people who really had the right skill sets and the right attitude to help mm-hmm. lead Sonangol forward was something that was just terribly interesting to me. I'm not a political person. I have never been into politics. And I have to say, a lot of what I did within Sonangol wasn't even, um, I had the autonomy to do it. So it wasn't even um, sort of directly under Isabel's guidance. Um, but, But it was a period sort of fraught with a lot of political issues and particularly because there were elections at the time as well. Mm -hmm. So a new president came into, into power. 
Um, and so it was at the time it was it was it was difficult because you sort of dragged into a situation that is not of your own. Uh, your motives are questioned. Your ethics are are, are questioned. Mm. Um, but for me, it was it was just yet another learning opportunity. It was yeah. it was an opportunity to look inside and to feel very comfortable with who I am, what my values are, what my intentions were and are, um, and to understand that what other people think of you really doesn't matter that much. You sort of identify people in your life that are important to you, and clearly they know who you are. And then what yeah. these voices and people out there are um, think of you is is pretty irrelevant uh, for me other people may yeah. have different positions yeah. and so but it was a it was an opportunity for growth and and today i look back and i feel very very good about that decision it was the right decision um i feel like i contributed um today i look at some of the things that are going on in that company and were things that my teams and i created and and yeah and, and i feel very vindicated um and then i moved on I'm, I'm one of those people, I, I'm like a stages of life. You finish a stage, you know, good, bad, indifferent, and you move on to the next one, to the, yeah. next, uh, the next challenges. And what was good, I was able to move on to, with the same intention that I had before, which was to work for an Angolan company and help make change in people's lives within the company and in the country. And so then after that, I moved on to Unitel and, and I'm having the ability to, over the last... Um, two years or so that I've been mm -hmm. in Unitel to, to be able to do that. I can only imagine how, how hard it was because anytime you have, in any job, it doesn't matter what job it is, if, you're, if it's a personality that's a celebrity or it's a larger than life personality, there's going to be something that comes with the job that you didn't sign up for. <laughs> and that's just kind of how it is. You know, and you have to be pragmatic about things, you know, clearly you go into situations, you need to do an analysis of what the situation is and what it, it may uh, be about. And then in the end, you need to understand your role um, in, in the situations and, and, and when they're not your own, how much do you get yourself worked up over? Yeah. Right. And it doesn't matter whether it is in this case, it was the chair, chairwoman that we had, it could be you know, the chairman of your corporation or whatever it is, um, you fight your own battles. You don't fight other people's yeah. battles. Yeah. Um, you, and, and that sort of was another lesson that I learned because oftentimes people would ask, what about this and what happened with this? And what do you think about this, about her or about this other person? And I'm someone that never in my life have I've done that. I think everybody has to fight their own battles, even when they're your friends or um, in your personal relationships or whatever. I'm, 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 I feel like people are adults and they need to, to fight their own, their own battles. But it's, um, it, and it's something that happens oftentimes when you move to more senior leadership roles, where yes. it becomes less about um, your substantive knowledge of, 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 of things and it becomes more about personalities and groups yep. and who's standing with who and maneuvering that uh, as you grow in your career, you become more exposed to and you need to be very clear with yourself who you are, what, what are your ethical uh, concerns, and how do you work uh, with base on that? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I started to, I learned, you know, when, when I said leading other people was, and I began telling my team this, always have a effort budget, is what I call it. Because there may come a time in your life when you just have to say, Lucy's, I'm out. Sometimes yes. the, you just come to that point where the option that makes the most sense to the core of your yes. being is to exit stage left. So that's one thing that was put in the back of my head. So as you talk about who you are and your ethics, what, for me, one of those core principles is always have a little something somewhere for a rainy day because someday you may need to tap into that budget and just say, exactly. this is the point yes. where I need to. You never want to be in a situation where you have no escape. And particularly as you get more senior in your work life and you're better compensated, um, you have a better opportunity to do that. You know, for many people starting early in career, the challenges are bigger because you may have fewer harder. options. But yeah. as, you, um, as you go further up in your career, um, those issues become more prominent as well. And so, yes, you always have to know that if you needed to ex exit stage left really fast, <laughs> that you would be able to do it. And, yeah. um, and, and that has to do with really knowing yourself. 
um, I just having a conversation with a friend the other day, sort of late into the night, about the fact that very few of us really do a lot of introspection. Mm -hmm. And when we do, it's always in function of something that you feel somebody did to you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so that introspection always concludes with, and I was right and he was wrong or she was wrong. Um, but this, this yes. really, sort of knowing ourselves, knowing our core, um, what our values are, what do we stand for, what, um, what, what it is that we accept and what we don't accept, mm -hmm. and, and how we manage also when people don't like us or aren't particularly kind to us. Um, we need to constantly be evaluating that. And that oftentimes, that's all you have when you have to, 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 to make certain decisions or take certain positions. Um, and uh, yeah, it is that, that, um, that self-evaluation that uh, we all yeah. want to do more of, but it's sort of contrary to human nature because oftentimes when you do that, you will also recognize things in you that maybe you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and those are difficult what, to, to deal with and to manage through. I love that you talked about acknowledging when people don't like you. I feel like the more we, we grow up as adults, the more we're like children in a sense, right? Because we, the whole idea that we get upset when people don't like us. When we were kids, these things bothered us, right? And it's a normal human reaction. We want to be liked. So it... As we get older, we get away from it. But you get to a point in your life where you're like, wait a minute, I have to engage this. What is it that's bothering me about this person? And sometimes they yeah. just don't like me. And I don't like the fact that they don't like me. But it's very hard for us to engage that, right? Because we think, oh, that's a childish thought. Not everybody has to like you. But I've found mm -hmm. that in engaging, like you said, and introspecting, it's okay. Nobody has to like you. Um, no, because <laughs> I think that oftentimes when someone, and I'll use my own personal experience, um, um, I, I consider myself a, a very friendly person. I, I, I'd like to think that I am. I, I have to say my semblance isn't particularly friendly. You know, sort of if, if, I'm not, if I'm not doing anything, if I'm just sitting, my face isn't particularly friendly. It's sort of not welcoming to people to come to me. And many people look at me that way and think, oh, she's very snobbish and she's stuck up. And, uh, and I went through a phase of my life that people would tell me this. They would say, oh, you know, so-and-so said they don't like you because they think you're very conceited or whatever it might be. And I would spend some time, so not necessarily worrying about questioning why, why that person doesn't like me and what did I do to that person? And I realized that person doesn't know me. That person doesn't have yeah. any basis whatsoever to decide yeah. whether I'm a good person or a bad person or worth knowing and not knowing. And, 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 and when you dislike someone so much that you give yourself the time to go tell somebody about it. Something's wrong with you. And if I do <laughs> that and I really bother me, then something's wrong with me. There's something in me I don't like and I'm seeing that sort of reflected back. And I would say that as I've grown older, I've, my, my quota of caring, sort of how random people think of me has decreased greatly. <laughs> uh, I sort of, if I I focus on too. Being, hmm? <laughs> And then don't you find you're happier as a result? Yes, we just, because, it, well, because yeah. the reality is, as you said a, a bit ago, um, you can't manage other people. You can't make people like you. And so I, I, I'd rather spend my energy trying to be the best possible person that I can. Yeah. And for those that have let me into their lives and open their lives to me to be present and accountable and, and, and do my part with them, rather than worrying about random people that I, you know, don't, uh, don't, don't know. Really and if them. someone doesn't like me and comes to me and, and explains that there's something that I did that hurt them or upset them in some way, then as I've grown more mature to learn to sit and listen and hear what they're saying. And oftentimes, um, and I was tested on this just about a year ago, um, a childhood friend that I hadn't seen in a very long time popped up, you know, and sort of back into my life. And, uh, and then a few months later, she, she sort of, we were just having a casual chat and she became very upset and, and sort of started telling me that, you know, when she first popped up again, I hadn't been particularly kind to her because I hadn't done this and I hadn't done that. And I remember thinking as she was talking that I just thought she was completely wrong. She made no sense. But then I looked at her and she just looked so hurt. And I, I felt very proud of myself in that moment that I just said, I'm sorry. 
I didn't feel sorry about what she was saying because I didn't even remember doing what she was saying. Yeah. But I just feel yeah. sorry because clearly something had hurt her. Yeah. Something, something I did or didn't say or the way I said it or didn't really had hurt her. And I thought, okay, then I need to own that. If this person is important enough to me, I need to own that. Yeah. It doesn't cost me anything to apologize and yeah. mean a lot to her. So I'd rather spend my time working on these things and trying to grow and, and develop as a person rather than worrying about whether people like me or not or whether their impression of me is right or wrong. I, over the last couple of years, I worried a lot when I thought people were questioning my character. Mm. You know, sort of where they would opine about my character and the kind of yeah. person that I am. And, and I had a difficult time with that for a while because I felt like I wanted to shout to the whole world, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Yes. And then it sort of caught up with me that I thought, mm, nah, that's a waste of time. I'm just going to wear myself out. Because <laughs> it's yeah. like this, the people who don't know me, but I've already judged me, they're not going to change because I'm justifying myself or explaining myself. So I'm just not going to worry with that. And that's something I try to talk to my kids about because they're at that age. Mm -hmm. Um, they're in high school and there's groups and people talk and people, yes. um, they're invited to some things. They're not invited to other things. And then, you know, there's all that drama. And so trying to teach them the lessons that I learned much later in life, trying to teach them earlier. Earlier, um, yeah. And it just, one, it doesn't matter. It won't matter. Like when you're 50, it won't really matter who invited it you. It really, it really <laughs> won't. <laughs> It really won't. It's amazing what we spend our time on. And as you go on in life, it's just like, how did I spend so much time on that thing? Exactly. It, it doesn't matter. Because no, as yes. you grow older, you realize life is short, right? It's Which, shorter. When you're 18, yeah, when you're 16, 17, 18, it seems like you have the, your whole life in front of you. Um, yeah. And so you can give yourself the luxury of worrying about all these things. And then as you get older, uh, not only you realize that your lifespan is shorter and, and tomorrow is not promised to anybody. And, and as you start losing friends and family members, that becomes even yep. more real. You realize also that your time can be used in much more productive ways. You know, things yeah. that really have an impact in your life and in other people's lives and, and sort of your concept of time management also changes. And so for me, that's sort of, the, the, the progress that I've been making in my life has sort of led me to these uh, realizations, which is not to mean that once in a while there's no slip ups or, you know, whatever. I'm just human. You're human. But, We're all uh, human. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. We're well, coming up on time and I want to be mindful and respectful of your time, but I also mm -hmm. want to, to talk about this one last thing because you've done all of this with three kids, <laughs> moving countries with three children. And so how, how have you done it? And, you know, one mother to another and to all the mothers who will be listening to this, that continues to be a conversation in 2020, the choices we have to make between career and motherhood. So what advice do you have? Where did you draw the strength from? Because I'm in awe of that. I have one and I'm like, oh, and you have three. <laughs> Yeah. So first, uh, I we we always have this chat here at home with the kids about these issues, and uh, um, I always thank God that He gave me or it gave me these children, uh, because they they are just perfect for my personality and my lifestyle. My kids just roll with the punches. They are the most yeah. adaptable children that you will ever find. Um, they just nothing, nothing I do will come up with shocks or surprises them because they just expect <laughs> the insane things. And so that really does help, but it, they are particularly resilient. Um, I not only have three children, but I'm a single mom. And so, mm -hmm. uh, while I do have a lot of support of friends and family, I am a single mom. And, um, I always made sure from early on that my kids understood sort of a little bit of reality of life, you know, adaptable to their level, yeah. but they've always known mom has to work because if mom doesn't work, we won't eat. And yes. I always made sure to tell, because, <laughs> you know, I talked to my kids about money since they were very little, not about money, the general concept, but that you need money to buy things and to do things. And you work not just for personal fulfillment, obviously, but also because I, you, I have to provide for my family because I needed them to understand that when mom wasn't there, this is why. And so, because I missed lots of things at school. Um, yep. And, and yep. Uh, so like many working moms do, 
Um, you know, there are moms that are stay at home who can go to the school and take the brownies and there are moms that work outside the home and have a little more flexibility and can do that. And at times in my life, I've had that flexibility and others I haven't. So um, I sort of just forgiven myself for missing a lot of those things. What I always yeah. made a case of not ever missing uh, unless absolutely there was no other way were school meetings about their grades, about their performance, or if they were performing in a play or a musical. But things yes. like PTA, the reading mom, I tried to do those things where I could. And when I couldn't, I just had to absolve myself of that guilt and work with my kids to understand that mom will always be there for the important things. And then there's other things mom just will not be there, okay. but yeah. I still love you anyway. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And so I think working moms or moms of any kind, you know, moms who work in the home or outside the home, we're always guilt tripping ourselves, whether you know, yes. so we do it to ourselves, our friends do it to us, society does it to us. We're always feeling like we're coming up short. We have this list that's, you know, sort of this size of things that we never to ends. Feel good about ourselves that never ends, you know, because not only in, it's just women in general, because like our kids have to be right. Our relationships, we have to lose weight. We have to eat healthy. We have to bake banana bread during COVID. We, you know what I mean? We have to learn a new <laughs> language. We're always giving ourselves all these tests. And so Work. one of the things I did, and it helped me, it helped some of the other moms. I just started flipping off uh, guilt, not, no, 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 no. Yep. I'm not going to let that go into my head and make me feel bad about the kind of mom that I am. I just sort of developed my own style of, of, of motherhood. And I always say, so far, the children seem to be okay. Time will tell <laughs> how yes. they'll actually turn out. And so I don't have any magical advice. The main thing was I just, I, I try very hard not to feel guilty. I tried because guilt doesn't take me anywhere. And so I, I tried to um, just focus on priorities. What is important? Not everything your child does is important for you to be there. So what, is the, what are the most important things for you, for them? And on those, you try really hard to be there. Um, and then for the rest, you just uh, let it go. And make your kids um, understand what you do. I used to take my children to work. Um, I know yep. not everybody can, but I used to, even if it was at lunchtime or at the end of the day, so they could see my office, they could meet my colleagues. I've always talked to my kids about what I do for a living. Um, and they're mm -hmm. very proud of having a mom that does this, frankly, because they haven't known any different. I've always just been like this. And yeah. so, but sort of sharing my life with them and making this a joint adventure that we have together. So I'm sure you did this for your son when you took off to South Africa and now Singapore is, we're going on an adventure to show them yeah. that they're also benefiting from this, this, um, this adventure and these challenges. And, um, and, and so far, so far, so good. So far, so good. It, it's such a joy always to talk to you, but <laughs> especially on these topics, I feel like I can talk to someone who, who understands where I am, is the single mama journey, is the adventurous journey, is the go figure it out and live your best life journey. Yeah. So Eunice, thank you so much. It's been oh, such a joy, you. such a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a pleasure. I'm so incredibly proud of you. You have no idea. It's uh, you're, you're on my list of people and not that I have any big credit, the credit is yours, <laughs> but uh, you're on my list of people that I feel like um, you've really grown in your life and in, in some small way I was able to, to, to help with that and, and I'm just filled with pride Indeed. because you've already gone so much further than I did and you're going to go even further and so it's, um, it's a great pleasure to see you really blossom um, in the world. I, I thank you for that first of all but I have to tell you I do, I do draw a lot of strength from the tribe every time <laughs> I have a conversation with you or Dara or both of you I'm just like you know what? I, I can go do anything because there's yeah, just so can. much support. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You really can. There's and so Dara and I are always here. So she's yeah. in Atlanta. I talk yeah. to her all the time. She's way yeah. great as well. And so anytime you need, we, we continue to be here for you. Yeah, no, it, it's wonderful. And, and, and here you are again being there for me. So thank you. And um, I, I, I do have to say that the guilt thing is such an important one because it, it can be crushing. So thank you for being so open, so candid about everything. And I do want to say to the audience that before we started, I asked you, is there anything that's opening for this conversation? And you said, no, 
I really appreciate that because it allows for a free flow of conversation and um, that, that's what we really connect to. So, ah, oh, okay. wow. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eunice, I'll let you get back to your Friday. You look fabulous as usual. And um, I'll probably catch you again on Instagram or LinkedIn. <laughs> yes, hope to see you back here. I still have to make it to Singapore. We talked about doing it last year and it all didn't work out. But there and I will come visit you sometime soon. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm hoping to be here for the foreseeable future. So I'm waiting for you too and you can travel again. Exactly. No, we will. We will. All right. My love to the kids. Have a good weekend. You too. Okay, take care. Bye. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Join us next week as lawyer Ron Garber takes us on a father's journey. Baby smile at six weeks, and this was the six-week email. It, you know, wasn't like she was late, but you know, maybe maybe we had a sense that that something was perhaps wrong because it it struck me and, so and I, hard. You know, I tell these stories. It's first of all, it's really hard for me to go to these places, sort of emotionally. Yeah, I've kind of built walls around them, and and I also I don't want anyone to feel bad for us or me or my family or or even Yaya, especially Yaya. And um, but I think our stories are really representative of what a lot of families affected by our disease go through, and I think what a lot yeah. of families affected by rare disease in general go through, and so. You know, I hope that sharing them sort of speaks to the burden of, of these diseases and why we've decided to do something about it.